I appreciate you guys uh, having me here, and uh, I hope I meet your needs. Uh, and I'll explain my understanding of uh, what you had requested here in a few minutes. So my presentation might be slightly different than some of the tires that are trying to meet the same goal. So um, from my experience and knowledge, um, what I wanted to bring forward were some ideas and research needs for lifeline infrastructure systems to improve seismic design codes and standards and meet some of the knowledge gaps. And I know that the purpose of this workshop goes beyond that, but I do have limitations. And as you notice from my bio, uh, my expertise is really in water systems, but I did help. I've worked in lifeline systems in general for quite a while. I did work for the Department of Water and Power, and I was a resilience manager for the city, which incorporates all of the lifeline systems as well as other community systems that, that Professor Vandalin had brought up. Uh, so my my knowledge base does go beyond that, but I am not an expertise in all of these lifeline systems. And also, I played a significant role in the American Society of Civil Engineers for uh, helping to initiate and develop the uh, current infrastructure resilience division, where we look at all of the uh, lifeline systems as well as part of that, the Technical Council on Lifeline Earthquake Engineering. And some of my mentors were the founders of Keekly for ASCE. And so I, I'm trying to bring forward a broader perspective than just my own personal experiences because the topic is lifeline systems. And, and I'll get to that in, in a little bit. So here's the outline of what I'm going to talk about, lifeline systems overview some current challenges, at least as far as I understand them, resilience, direction in current developments, some research needs applicable to this testing facility, and then some conclusions. So, so um, unlike all the prior presentations, except for maybe SIPI, which was a little more general, geotechnical structures, um, lifeline systems are a broad group of systems. Uh, so I'm not talking about buildings. I'm not talking about geotechnical structures. I'm not talking about bridges. I'm talking about water systems, wastewater systems, stormwater systems, electric power systems, communication systems, gas and liquid fuel systems, transportation, although I won't get into the specialty area of bridges, but transportation systems as a whole on all of the modes and solid waste systems. And these systems have to work for the community and their social technical systems, meaning that you have to have the, the people who manage them interact with the technical components or they don't work at all, right? These are to provide services to the community and and um, it, 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 they're very broad. So they are large geographically distributed systems. They're made of numerous interlinked and specialized components, which include bridges, which include buildings. So when I talk about components, in my language, a bridge, even though it's a system into itself, as just uh, elegantly explained, is a component. A building, which is a system into itself, in a lifeline system, I'll talk about it as an individual component. A dam. Uh, which could be a geotechnical structure, um, or the levees, right, or, or even the foundations. Uh, these these are considered components in, in the lifeline system, right? So in a water system, you'll have a, a dam holding back a reservoir, which supplies, which is for a water supply system, which connects to the bigger part of the system. But that's just one component in this larger context. So these systems are interdependent. Craig, excuse yes. me to interrupt you. In case you are showing a slide right now, I don't know if you started to show a slide. We, we don't see it. Oh, no. Um, I'm actually, are you still on the very first slide? Uh, no, we don't see any slide. I, I think you, did you uh, double click on share screen? You should I see did. It. I'm sorry, I should have asked. Uh, okay, I think it's coming. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I should have asked. Hmm. All right. Well, you've missed half my presentation. That's all right. Not quite that. All but right. You, so you may you may want to put it in presentation mode, Craig. I'm so sorry. Well, it was at one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tricky. 
I apologize for that. I should have asked. Uh, come on. Yeah, the button that you, but now it's back out. We don't see it again. Uh, let's see. Try to do it. And if you just click the presentation mode now. Yeah, the problem was my. Uh, there we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the uh, the internet stuff was in the way. Okay. Um, so most of that verbal stuff had some language to go with it that uh, you could look at on your own if you wanted to understand better. So what I was uh, leaving with were, were these. So uh, I just explained what lifeline systems are here, and I have them listed in the, the social technical systems. And I was going over uh, this slide here where there are numerous interlinked specialized components. Uh, they're interdependent and they consist of a variety of subsystems. So uh, even though I was explaining the component, uh, like like dams or, or um, certain structural systems like bridges or buildings are, in my language that I'll be describing here, are listed as components, um, they, there are also these components help make up subsystems. So as an example, when I'm referring to subsystems, you know, if you have a water system, Subsystems would be the supply, treatment, uh, transmission, and distribution. Again, all of which could contain these components, right? So in a water system, uh, a tank or reservoir is a component of one of the subsystems. The treatment plant, which is a massive system into itself, is a component of the treatment subsystem. And so on for transportation and, and, and all of the other systems. They all have a variety of subsystems. Uh, and these subsystems, all have separate owners and operators. So for example, uh, one company might own an oil refinery and somebody, another company might own the, 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 um, the oil and gas extraction facilities and different companies would own the, the uh, pipes or the, the transport systems to move this to the refinery. Then somebody else might own a different set of systems to move the refined products to places of distribution and so on. So all of these have to coordinate and work together, uh, even in a disaster, or you don't get the services that you need. So these are complications of lifeline infrastructure systems that uh, either don't exist in the other types of components or systems that we've been talking about, or they're scaled up to be much more dramatic. So we have to keep that in mind when we're talking about lifeline systems. Uh, oh, there we go, okay. So some current system challenges. There are limited codes and standards governing seismic design of, of lifeline systems. Some of these are well developed, like we just saw in bridges um, and in buildings. And some are completely non-existent in other systems uh, or, or for the component, right? And, and even, even though we have bridge design uh, well developed in many areas, the seismic design of the transportation system as a whole, the whole highway system, is not well developed to be resilient, for example. Uh, I don't know if there's actually a seismic design code or standard for how the entire highway system is performed, uh, as an example. Um, there's inconsistent approaches and criteria within a single system, or across, and especially across systems. So uh, in water systems, you got tank design, you got pipe design, but they're not necessarily these different standards. They're not necessarily linked up to the same performance objectives. Uh, as an example of what that means, there's a wide range of regulation. So for some components or systems as a whole, there will be limited to no regulation. Um, and in others, uh, just for certain components, you might have multi-jurisdictional regulations. Like in California, there, for dams, there would be FERC and the California Division uh, of Safety Dam, uh, both looking at the same structure So uh, and highly regulated. So, so we have a wide range of, of those issues. We need to create resilient lifeline systems consistent with community resilience. John Vandalin brought this up. Sissy brought this up. So we need community resilience goals, but they're limited to non-existent in most cities. And right now, they're kind of left up to if a city wants to do this. And lifeline systems provide services to make these communities resilient. But right now, they have to develop them on their own if they want to claim that they're a resilient system. And there's very limited guidance on that. 
Um, and then there's disparate recovery-based goals across lifeline systems, if they exist at all. And um, then we have the need for functional recovery, uh, which which is uh, part of the reauthorization. Um, and since he brought up functional recovery and gave, gave an example of, of some of that in, in her presentation earlier. Um, so then let's get a little bit more into lifeline system resilience. It's multidimensional. There's, there's lots of dimensions, but I'm going to give you just an example of three very commonly understood for resilience, robustness, uh, redundancy, rapidity, and resourcefulness. These have been referenced in some of the earlier presentations as well. And thinking about physical testing, I, I thought about, well, what is it that we're looking at? Um, so remember, we're talking about resilience of a whole system, not a component. And so robustness of the components is, is usually what we're talking about for physical testing or or um, some of the combinations of components and how they interlink. Sometimes we're talking about redundancy. So redundancy in, in the bridge system was just brought up quite well. But when you're talking about a system as a whole, you might be talking about two parallel transmission lines coming from two different sources of, of power generation. Right? That's also a redundancy. And so it's not redundancy within the same components, but redundancy within the system as a whole. And, and it, we may include some aspects of rapidity and resourcefulness, but without all of these, you can't have a resilient system. So physical testing is important, very, very important, but insufficient to create a resilient lifeline system, right? Because we have to have all of these other things. Uh, so I just wanted to have everybody keep that in mind. And so now some current momentum in lifeline earthquake engineering. Uh, there's a big push and developments for a framework for recovery-based objectives that would be consistent across all lifeline systems and buildings as well, building the system, um, to develop and improve existing codes, standards, and guidelines. So uh, I separate here develop because I mentioned that some don't exist, and to improve existing. Right, and and uh, all of these have to be done on a, a consistent with the framework, which is why the framework is bullet number one. Then establish design levels so that systems can meet the recovery-based objective. Establish the design levels for it. each component can ensure the system meets. Right, so that that fourth bullet is to support the third bullet because resilience is a systems level concept. Um, and then define how to meet the objectives by designing new components, subsystems, and systems, and modifying the existing components, subsystems. Okay, so these are some of the things being worked on. So now what I'm going to do is go through some research needs. And I'm going to talk about it at the lifeline system level and some key components uh, to give examples. I'm not going to be able to talk about all of the different lifeline systems and all the different components that I'm not intending to. I'm not going to talk about all of the different types of materials that can be researched, all the different types of structural systems that could be used, or the geotechnical systems that could be used to improve uh, uh, the lifeline systems and their resilience. And, and all of that's implied, right? So I'm talking about at a higher level. So when I'm talking about pipelines, for example, there's a wide variety of pipelines and new materials can be made and all of those can be embedded into these research concepts that I'm bringing forward. So, so keep in mind the level that I'm talking about and use your imagination as we go forward and understand that this is just to give some ideas. There's no way I could talk about all the different types of things that need to be done for all of these different uh, systems that are made up of all these different unique components, right? So the research and specialized equipment. Here, I'm just going to give some examples. Uh, wind turbines, which have already been tested, but wind turbines tested in multi-directional shaking. It's going to be a huge difference. So I should have probably gave an example of, of the Los Angeles Reservoir outlet power, which is about 80 feet high, shaken uh, by near-source pulses in the 1994 Northridge earthquake. A recording on that showed that it circled with 1G shaking 10 times. That's very different than... Right, so it's just swinging in a circle 10 times with 1G at the top. That was recorded. So imagine this with this windmill doing that, not just two-dimensional shaking, but three-dimensional. It's quite different. So it's really important to take a look at that. 
Um, communication towers, they, they have different masses uh, changing all over and the connections for those. Uh, pipes and turbines, I show a, a vertical turbine down at the bottom. Uh, it's a heavy mass at the top while it's spinning. Um, there's large valves that are this, I, I'm showing in the middle of UV uh, ultraviolet treatment plant uh, for the Los Angeles Park Water and Power. But what I'm showing here is that it could, it could be a smaller vault of just one line or these large systems. But, but think of a, a very long pipe that might be miles long that comes from the ground and then passes with, uh, without being anchored to the wall, right? It's just an opening that, that collects axial strain from wave propagation. And now you have uh, inertial shaking going in the opposite direction um, as, as with flexible connections and so on and, and rigid connections where you have these multidimensional movements that have never been analyzed before that's affecting this, which looks like a, a, a simple structure, but if you were to look at it in greater detail, you'll see all these different types of connections uh, on this one single pipeline and, and the things that are going on. So things that have never really been fully addressed, but are probably important. And then you see just some wastewater filters. If you would blow that up here on the left in that image, you would see that it, it's uh, actually quite a, a set of complicated structures into themselves, right? It's made up of a bunch of different things that need to not be broken during an earthquake. So think of also um, uh, traffic control towers at an airport, right? A very large um, uh, type of uh, structure that you could analyze. So, so lifeline systems are made up of these components of, of above and below ground uh, specialized things that all have to work intimately together. And, and uh, just a wide variety of different types of things that are, uh, are affected. Then there's the interaction of multi-system components. So think of think of um, this large table as an opportunity to put multiple portions of a subsystem together. So you saw um, actually that there was an example that Joel pointed out from a uh, you know a power table on a on a few poles, right? So. That would be a small portion of these examples that I'm showing on the right of this, this diagram. But then there's there's uh, brittle brittle insulators, and then you could use different materials to create flexibility on that. And and there's rigid connections, and there's there's how much sag you put in the cable lines, and, and all of this moving in three dimensions makes a big difference on how these systems perform. So with this table, you can either use full scale or maybe scale them down and put multiple components and how they actually interact, because they're all interconnected in high plane systems. They're not individual buildings that could just sway and hit each other if you're close, but you would all, uh, walk in between them or maybe you have a bridge. But all of these, these systems are connected together. So also think of the complications of an oil refinery, right? Uh, again, one component, uh, just like a substation, in, 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 but it's made up of all these intricate components. And look at these big towers and and things that, that are interconnected. Uh, very unique structures, but really, really important to life lenses. Um, think of the underground piping in water, oil, wastewater, uh, natural gas systems, and, and how that might be analyzed when it's affected by liquefaction. I'll get back to some of that in, in future slides here. But uh, just to give some ideas on the importance of looking at the subsystem. Then there's the interaction of multiple system components, including both shaking and differential movement. And these differential movements might be ever so slight, but uh, I'll give you some examples here in this slide of how important it could be using some rigid electric power connections. So here's an example from Lushan, China, uh, from the 2013 earthquake that I investigated. And what we have is an electric power substation being supported on one side by a gravity retaining structure. And then above that, you have a, 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 just a vertical wall that was unreinforced and it fell over. That's not the point that I'm talking about. You do see that on the lower left structure. What I'm talking about on the lower left uh, picture is the gravity retaining structure that's down below. It's quite high, maybe 15 feet high. Uh, and then it's supporting a portion of this electric substation. On the right, what we see is near the margin of, of, of what happened uh, where the gram cracking occurred because the gravity retaining structure had moved, we see ground cracks. Uh, they moved anywhere from just uh, fractions of inches to uh, 
uh, simulation of maybe six inches. But if you take a look at the, the equipment that's in the lower right image, you see that there's damage in some of these flexible and, and rigid connections. So some of these were actually flexible, but not flexible enough. Well, I don't know that any of the codes or standards for electric power, and I could be wrong, I'm not an electric power expert, but I have asked around, how much do they actually account for permanent ground movement? And so now we have uh, multiple issues that should be tested with shaking as well as when permanent ground movement occurs. Or if, if the shaking's not a damage, then maybe maybe the uh, even small amount of permanent ground deformation should be accounted for. So as, as one idea. Now, Dual assures me that this equipment could actually be used for fault rupture. So I just threw out some ideas of some potential uh, near full scale or full scale testing that might be used. Uh, one of those might be to confirm test uh, on underground piping uh, that, that have been done at the Cornell box, which they show an image of uh, in the upper right. Uh, they've done a tremendous amount of work on pipelines, maybe between six and 12 inches in diameter, but a lot of the lifeline underground systems go much larger than that. And so, so on this test bed, you might be able to uh, confirm the behavior or disconfirm the behavior of larger diameter pipes compared to the smaller diameter pipes. And, and then put that in the numerical modeling method so that we don't have to test all pipes. And all the different types of liners and, and uh, materials and jointing connections that can go with that, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff that can be done on large diameter that uh, so far has not been able to be validated uh, because we can only test the smaller diameter. Um, but it, that would be a tremendous help. Uh, then the behavior of co-located lifelines. So I show an example of lifelines crossing the San Andreas Fault. So here, you, with this large test bed, you can vary and just statically, well, semi-statically, or quasi-static move a fault rupture. But you could actually look at the interaction of multiple closely spaced underground structures and how they affect each other. Um, that, that, I don't believe, has ever been done before. Um, uh, then we can take a look at uh, tunnel liners. Right? I show two examples of different types of tunnel liners, concrete and steel. But there's, there's a wide variety of these. But you know, we're 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 putting uh, railways through and tunnels through faults, and we're designing for that. But we really don't have a good understanding of how these different liners behave, or even if they'll collapse in in a from real testing uh, when when they're they're ruptured uh, with, with the, you know shear or thrust movement. Um, and then and then I don't show an image for this last bullet, but there's there needs to be a better understanding of how fault, fault ruptures from a rigid bedrock, face rock ruptures up to weaker soils, including potential liquefied soils up above, and how that uh, affects uh, the, the shallow buried structures, uh, the lifeline systems uh, above that, right? So things that I think maybe could be used. Then there's an idea of that, that in the lifeline industry, we're using margins of landslides are assumed to behave similar to a fault rupture. So if you have a, a strike slip fault, that's kind of the vision of the way we look at margins of landslide. Uh, but, but there's a landslide actually has two margins, right? So the width of this landslide is really important. We really don't understand how this interacts with the stresses and strains in varied structures, right? So especially when we're looking at moving uh, uh, pipes moving across a landslide or, or cables or any type of buried structure, uh, transversely, longitudinally, or especially obliquely, right? These types of things maybe could be tested in a test box that could simulate landslide movement. Or if you could do two shear movements, um, uh, like two fault ruptures at once, I don't know. Uh, but just some ideas. I don't know if you could accommodate this, but some things that would be really helpful. And to confirm if this concept that you could just use the default rupture as a margin of a landslide and, and simulate things this way. Uh, then liquefaction. So uh, in the lower right, I show this is an eight-foot diameter pipe that buckled from liquefaction in the 1994 Northridge earthquake. You see this eight-foot pipe buckled to uh, uh, this is actually my PhD dissertation, and, and my fingers, which are not really very wide, could not fit between portions of it. They completely buckled to zero dimension. Um, so what are the mechanisms behind this that could be tested? The mechanics of uplift and floating. 
uh, there's there's a lot of discussion on this. Uh, how important is this? Although I, I'm showing a sewer pipe in the middle and the Hoka earthquake where it's uplifted several feet, but but uh, in different types of varied systems, there's discussions on the importance of this, and that could be investigated. And then the effect of lateral spreading on varied pipe networks. So here I show an axial pipe, which is the most common analysis of an infinitely long uh, pipe at moving. Uh, are buried and the lateral spread occurs along the axis of the pipe. But in reality, we're not analyzing a network, which I show here now, that it's a network of distribution pipes that are with T's and L's and PALs and all kinds of connections and press blocks and all kinds of things going on. That's not been investigated. I don't know if you could use this larger uh, set of testing equipment to simulate uh, a lateral spread and the margins of that lateral spread and how it affects an entire network uh, scaled to some level. You might actually be able to use full scale if you use two to a four inch diameter pipe. I don't know, but just an idea that you might be able to undertake. Uh, wave propagation. So uh, Joel was talking about the rocking motion. He had mentioned that to me a few weeks ago, which brought up a thought in my head. I don't know if you can simulate Raleigh waves on this machine, but that would be pretty awesome if you could because there's a need for better understanding the strains in the ground caused by Raleigh waves, surface waves, and how that strain propagates into pipelines so that we could better understand the design of very pipeline subjected to surface waves. Uh, so I'll throw that challenge out to you. I don't know if that's possible. Um, I'll also, on this next bullet, I'll show uh, an image in the next slide. But um, uh, so, Pipelines, uh, a lot of times, come up with long linear lines, usually pipelines, that um, uh, they're, uh, are of importance. To, you know, you got long cables, you got, you got very long structures and such of stuff. So I don't know if this table can simulate difference from movement at each support, but I thought about that over the past few days, and I think you could. So we have multi-supported pipelines or other types of, of cables and so on. And we need to investigate the behavior of the different types of support. So think of a bridge, right? We just saw long span bridges with multiple support, but these things go miles and miles and miles. Uh, so, so we need to understand how that is affected. These structures are affected by how a wave propagates through this. So think of the Raleigh surface wave propagating along the length of this or, or, or oblique to it. So there'll be multiple piers on, with simple foundations or piers those piers might be deeply uh, connected. Those different types of, of connections and, and foundations need to be identified. And then say, for example, you have a pipe on this pier. Uh, it might be a saddle pier where the pipe is just sitting on it, or it might be rigidly connected to this, uh, right? So we have all kinds of different motions uh, taking place. So we need to address how these different connections affect the behavior of the structure and how how a wave propagating through there changes all of this, right? So let me give you an example of this in an image. So in the major part of this picture, what I'm showing is a Los Angeles aqueduct in the north end of the San Fernando Valley. Um, it was severely shaken by, uh, at the time, both times, uh, record-breaking ground motions from the 1971 and the 1994 Northridge earthquake. But never, never damaged. So what you see here is there are some, I don't know if I could put the, I don't know how. There we go, I could put a laser. So we have saddle supports here. So think of a concrete uh, pier that's going about a quarter of the diameter. It's curved and this, it, it's cast in place, curved. It's just sitting on the ground with a, this bearing on the ground. Um, uh, and, and so this, this pipe is just sitting on it. If there's no saddle support, it's not rigidly connected, it's just sitting on this concrete pier, right? You just see them up in here a little bit easier. I probably should have blown up a picture for you to take a look at that. Um, but with, with very large accelerations, uh, reaching or exceeding one G, very large displacement, reaching or exceeding one meter or three feet, and very large velocities reaching 180, or, or greater centimeters per second, um, this, this pipe was not damaged in two earthquakes. But yet, structural engineers want to come in and make these rigid connections. Uh, deep foundations uh, replacing these piers with 
on piles and putting rigid straps around the outside. So it would be really important to understand how does this pipe actually rock as, as it's sitting in this pier because it's not connected. How does this pier um, actually rock on the ground, right? It's not, it's not rigidly anchored into the ground. And then how do those different motions change? And we have this long structure with each pier rocking differently and it's torsionally moving, right? So this happens to be a, um, a riveted steel pipe. So it's actually able to move at each joint connection. It's not welded steel, which, which would accumulate more stress at each pulse. So all of these different things play a big difference. We do not understand this, but yet uh, engineers are changing things based on what they think current philosophy is, which is rigid connections, as opposed to flexible connections, uh, which are proven to be quite useful, similar to the bridges discussed earlier, and, and past experience. So all of these things really should be investigated further, maybe have an opportunity uh, here. Um, and then we have water splashing, right? So we have uh, treatment plants with, with uh, different tanks of water. And I'm showing some examples. I don't know if you could put a water tank and simulate some of these things, but we have sensitive structures that could be affected uh, by water sloshing, you know, baffles, clarifiers, and so on. We have um, uh, uh, surge pressures in large water pipelines uh, and their effects. So we have these long pipelines that move around. Somehow there's a generation of surge pressures from the shaking, uh, which isn't well understood. And then we have connections to these. And I'm showing an example of an air vacuum valve that have a ball. So in past earthquakes, these balls have been completely crushed by the high level of pressure um, that, 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 that is generated. So another idea of maybe things that could be investigated. We have buried box structures, very common types of structures in lifeline systems of all types. Um, but, and so I'm showing um, a box structure, which is a long linear, saying infinitely long in the lower right, which is actually a task that was done uh, in the past there in San Diego using the earlier version of this. And I'm showing a, a box structure that has shear walls on the side. It's a true box, right? It has an end cap. Um, so the, the blue would be actually an end to this. So think of a large vault or building type structure underground. Um, and so it, 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 the top behaves as a diaphragm. The bottom be behaves as a foundation of some kind. Uh, there's deflections in there. Uh, just from the diaphragm, uh, they have varying dimensions of uh, height, length, and width. But as those dimensions, right, so you have a very rigid on the, at the shear walls um, in the lateral direction. The shear walls don't move very much, but if this is a very long span, you're going to get the middle moving a lot, right? So that's the, the, the displacement of that, uh, the diaphragm. But as we know, soil pressures are a function of on a wall as a function of the displacement of that wall. So we get varying dis deflections and varying pressures along these structures that are not well understood. And are we properly designing these right would be my question based on this basic concept. Uh, these are questions that come around in the industry. Then we have really complicated underground structures. I just show an example uh, from the internet of how complicated these subway stations might be. And, and so think of the things that John Vandalin presented for above ground multi-story structures. Now put that underground with escalators and, and um, elevators and stairways and, and uh, multi-levels, you know, sometimes three, four, five levels of subway station in some of these things. So they can get very, very complicated and these aren't well investigated and maybe could be tested. So in conclusion, I'd like to remind you that lifelines are very large, complicated systems made of numerous specialized components. Uh, there are limited code standards and guidelines dictating the seismic design. There is a need to create uh, and improve standards incorporating recovery-based design consistently across all lifeline systems. Several potential research ideas have been presented, but I, I don't think that I, I, I think I'm just barely touching the surface. Hopefully I've sparked some imagination for people to utilize uh, uh, through, throughout all of these lifeline systems and specialized components. And, and you can come up as experts in testing, you can come up with ways to um, utilize this, the, the, the advanced testing machines that you have to uh, improve the performance of lifeline systems into the future. So thank you, and hopefully I haven't gone uh, 
overtime and so not matter. Uh, and I'm sorry for the uh, confusion at the beginning. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. If there's any questions, please feel free to put them in the uh, Q and A. I see one question here. I'll read it out. Uh, what about nonlinear numerical modeling considering SSI and asynchronous motion? The size makes the problem very complicated. How do you address it? Um, it should be incorporated first of all because things behave non-linearly. Uh, the, the question makes me think of my example of the, the long linear structures and um, the, the numerical modeling of that can begin to give you ideas that I think that the problem, even though it might seem simple, uh, is much more complicated than what you're going to be able to know how to vision and imagine in just a numerical model. So my suggestion would be to incorporate that with testing. Um, uh, and so good numerical modeling uh, in research and in practice with testing that uses practical aspect of what is actually incorporated in the field, similar to a good, good, good ideas on this were described in earlier presentations. The coupling of that is what I think we need. So hopefully I'm answering your question. 